Your Honor, if I could, as a preliminary matter, I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Sure. Okay. Okay. My name is Thomas Hart, and I'm special counsel for the IBT Local 863 Pension Fund. The questions that are presented to the court by this appeal involve a provision of ERISA that sets out the formula and method for determining what the annual withdrawal liability is. Where did the district court go wrong? I'm sorry, say again, Your Honor. Where did the district court go wrong? It seems to me he did a pretty darn good job in figuring this out. Well, we fully agree with the court's analysis with respect to the multiple contribution rate. Sure. We do think, however, that it was an error when it determined, when it ruled that the highest contribution rate did not include a PPA-mandated increase in the contribution rate, and I'm prepared to discuss that now if you'd like. Maybe you could get into that. Sure, I'd be glad to, Your Honor. In the course of doing that, I'm sure you'll deal with this, but why isn't what we're talking about primarily from your perspective is the arising under issue and whether or not 4212 comes into play given that the liability kicks on 4219. But the Supreme Court has a footnote, it's footnote 11, in lightweight, I keep calling it lightweight, it's not lightweight. It's advanced lightweight concrete is the name of the case, yes. And that seems to me, I understand the issue there was different. You can only argue that it's dicta. But that seems pretty clearly to say that the arising under collective bargaining agreement, the two parts of your argument, one is whether it arises under the CBA or arises under labor management relations laws. We can get to the CBA in a second. But as to the second part of that, it seems pretty clear that the court is saying what Congress intended insofar as arising under labor management relations law is the NRLA, not ERISA. And that, again, to argue. Well, I'd be glad to address that. But let me first say that what the statute provides in section 4212A is that the meaning of obligation to contribute is an obligation that arises under one or more collective bargaining agreements or related agreements or both or a duty or as a result of a duty under an applicable labor management relations law. I want to first postulate that there is no statute. I've never run across, and I've looked a lot, for any law that defines the words labor management relations law. Now, clearly the National Labor Relations Act is such a law. But the fact that the statute uses that phrase does not mean that anything else is precluded. Right. Now, let me go into the advanced lightweight case for a minute because that case is really not at all involved here. What advanced lightweight involved, what was involved in advanced lightweight, is a pension plan tried to enforce a contribution right that it claimed it had for a collective bargaining agreement that had expired. Under established NLRA law, and I do this sort of thing all the time, when a collective bargaining agreement has expired under its terms, you enforce contribution obligations only by going to the National Labor Relations Board. Now, I understand all this, but I said you could argue that footnote 11 is dicta because that really was not the issue. It was really a jurisdictional issue, whether it's the federal district court or the NRL. I'm sorry, Your Honor, but that footnote was really in the context of whether the National Labor Relations Act, whether the National Labor Relations Act is a labor management relations law, and it clearly was. It did not address the question of whether any other kind of law that affects employer-employee relationships is also a labor law. As I said, there is no. It's not exclusive. I mean, I think that's pretty clear. You're correct on that, but how do we define it? How far does it go? Is the Internal Revenue Code a labor management relations law? No, it is not. Only to the extent that it would affect the bargaining relationship, say, between the parties or employee-employer obligations. Well, is Section 401 entitled Qualified Pension, Profit Sharing, and Stock Bonus Plans? I mean, that's a fairly detailed provision regarding 
profit sharing plans. But, Your Honor, the statute that we're dealing with here is ERISA, and while it is true the Internal Revenue Code may not, for most purposes, be considered a labor relations act, still the ERISA itself is. What it does is the PPA specifically says that when a plan is deemed to be in critical status, contributing employers automatically are required to increase their contribution rate in the first year for 5 percent and the second year 10 percent. This is essentially a change in the collective bargaining obligations of the parties by fiat. Now, one other thing that the statute says, 4212A, is that it talks about the obligation to contribute is an obligation arising out of several things. First is one or more collective bargaining agreements. The second thing is or a related agreement, that's in the statute as well, or as a result of a duty under applicable labor management relations law. Now, I've talked about the fact that I believe that this is clearly that kind of labor management relations law because it does affect what an employer has to contribute. It is not precluded from being a labor law because the Congress in 1980 used the term labor management relations law. Remember, Congress could have said an obligation under the National Labor Relations Act. It did not. It used a more generic phrase. And I think that the reason for that is that Congress understood there could be other laws that would affect that kind of relationship and contributions pursuant to that would be considered a contribution obligation under the statute. Now, one of the other categories in this section, 4212A, is that if it's an obligation that arises under a related agreement, and here we have such an agreement, the trust agreement that governs the IBT Local 863 Pension Fund states that an employer who is participating in the plan is obligated to make all payments required by law. I would submit, Your Honor, that this is such a requirement by law, and for this reason also we have an obligation that has arisen under section 4212A. Now, there's yet another reason why I think it's clear that the surcharge increase is considered an obligation and has to be considered in the highest contribution rate, and that is when you look at how the PPA was subsequently amended. Originally, the PPA provided that, and I'm going to read this, if you'll forgive me, in what was then section 304B7A. Oh, sorry, that's the, what it, pardon me. What it said was that any surcharges, this would have been 305B9, any surcharges shall be disregarded in determining an employer's withdrawal liability under section 4211. That's the general provision in ERISA that provides for imposition of withdrawal liability, except for purposes of determining the unfunded vested benefits allocable to an employer. Now, remember, the purchase, the purpose of withdrawal liability is so that when an employer has terminated its relationship with a multi-employer plan, if there are still unfunded vested liabilities that are created by its workforce, it has an obligation to keep paying those within the meaning of the statute. The statute here originally, again, said that it disregarded any surcharges with respect to withdrawal liability, except for purposes of determining unfunded vested benefits. That's exactly what struck me when I read it. It seems to me it was a strong argument, but their counter to that, I believe, is that if it's not, if the obligation is not part of the obligation that arises under 4212, there'd be no need to accept it out in the language of 4219. Now, what's wrong with that rejoinder to your argument? 
Well, let me, let me rephrase this if I can. When the worker retiree, re, worker retiree employer, um, uh, and I can never remember what the R stands for, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Act, which is known as WERA, which was passed in, 20, in 2008, it changed the law. What it did was the language that I just read to you about not considering surcharges in connection with withdrawal liability except for determining uh, the allocation of unfunded vested benefits. That was repealed, and in its place, the WERA simply said that now you do not take into account a surcharge only in respect to the allocation of unfunded vested benefits. In other words, it was the opposite mm -hmm. of what was provided originally in the PPA. Now, Congress uh, just last month changed the law yet again, and while I realize that it's not dispositive... Congress did something last month? Oh, yes. Whether you agree with it, it's another Amazing. matter, but they definitely did something. I'm delighted to hear this. <laughs> okay, as part of the budget, as part of the Budget Act, there was a hundred. And there was a division of it called Division I, if I recall correctly. That it was about 124 pages that made major changes to the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And one of those changes, which we briefed in the supplemental brief that we submitted uh, about a week ago, about 10 days ago actually, it for the first time changed the law. So now, 405 Section 405E7 specifically says that in determining what the highest contribution rate is under the, uh, un under the formula in 4219C1 uh, cap CI, you do not take into account the increase from the surcharge. In fact, you don't take into account any increase required by the, by the PPA. That also includes increases that result, say, from uh, funding improvement plans or rehabilitation plans. That was never in the language before, and we think that's a fairly clear indication that Congress had expected that before this law went into effect, it was to be included. Now, one other factor about the uh, uh, Multi-Employer Pension Reform Act, that's the law that was passed, enacted just last month, is that law is effective prospectively only, effective December 31st, 2014. If that law was to uh, simply codify what Congress thought was the existing law uh, or, or otherwise uh, make it uh, clarify it, there would have been no reason to make it uh, prospective only. It would have been made retroactively. We suggest that this is Congress deciding to change the rules. And if it felt that the rules were correct in the first place, there would have been no reason or need for it to do so. Uh, I've exhausted my time prior to rebuttal, well, but I'm happy to answer any questions. There's another, you're both appellants here, and maybe you take some extra time and address their argument um, on appeal. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, we didn't give you enough time, and there are two appeals basically before us, but you're both, you cross appellants. Right. And maybe you can take some extra time and address uh, their issue. You can address the the 10 percent issue, but there's another issue here. That oh, is sure. The and the, that is contribution rates. Yes. Okay. What the ERISA provision that, it, that we're dealing with here provides is that the formula for calculating the annual payment of withdrawal liability that must be made by an employer following its withdrawal from a multi-employer defined benefit pension plan has two factors, basically. Uh, the first is it requires the determination of the average number of contribution base units in a three-year consecutive period prior to the withdrawal. Is that just hours paid, CBU? Well, that that's usually what it means. It could mean, for example, uh, some collective bargaining agreements are paid by shifts, mm -hmm. but, over, but the great bulk of collective bargaining agreements have hourly contribution rates and hourly pay rates. But that's why it doesn't say hours rates. It just talk, talks about contribution base units. So, as I said, the, the first factor is to determine what that amount is, the average number of contribution base units in a three-year consecutive period. 
That number is then multiplied by the second factor, which is the highest contribution rate at which the employer is obligated to contribute. What the withdrawn employer here is suggesting is that that language, which we think, and the district court agreed, is absolutely clear and unequivocal, actually means something other than what it says. It makes two arguments. First, it argues that, well, let me just, one point to make before then. Another, when you look at the statute as a whole, it becomes even more apparent that this is the case, because again, looking at section 4212A, it shows that Congress was well aware that there could be employers who withdrew who were subject to more than one collective bargaining agreement, and it also shows that Congress was aware that there could be collective bargaining agreements with more than one contribution rate. It shows the words highest contribution rate. Congress could have used average if it wanted to do so. In fact, it did so in the first part of the formula when it talked about the average number of contribution base units. It could have said, well, there's a limit on the amount of, on the annual payment. It knew how to do that because it did put a limit on the total number of annual withdrawal liability payments that an employer is required to make. That's 20 years. So Congress knew how to do this. The fact that it didn't is, I think, dispositive here. This is a very fair- You're saying the highest rate means the highest rate. Exactly. Now, it's a well-established principle of statutory interpretation, and if you will forgive me, I'm just going to quote a decision of this third circuit, which I ran across in researching as I was looking at some of your earlier decisions. There are, in my brief sites, a number of cases for the principle that when a court sees a statute that is clear and not susceptible to other interpretations, that's the end of the argument. You don't go any further. And in fact, this court, in a couple of instances, one of them being BG Construction Industries against the Director of Workers' Compensation, and another one, In re Harvard Industries versus IRS, which was actually authored by Judge McKee. Oh, sorry. Yes, Judge McKee. You beg your pardon? When I was rehearsing, I wasn't sure who would be right in front of me and who was not. But it makes it clear that that's it. What the withdrawn employer here is saying is that when you look at the legislative history, it somehow becomes clear that what Congress expected to occur is something different than what it actually said. This principle of statutory interpretation means that once the court has decided that this is clear and unequivocal, that's it. You don't look behind for supposed meaning of Congress that is something different than the words that it actually used. One other argument that they have made is that although the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, which has the primary authority to administer the Title IV of ERISA, which deals with withdrawal liability, although they have never actually issued any regulation on the meaning of Section 4219C1 Cap C I, but 24 years ago they did write an opinion that the withdrawn employer here is arguing is somehow ought to be followed by this court. That's Opinion Letter 90-2. That opinion letter actually dealt with an entirely different issue. In that particular case, the Board of Trustees of the plan that was at issue had adopted an alternative withdrawal liability calculation figure for determining the employer's annual payment. Actually, it had the right under the statute to do that. Section 4214 of ERISA specifically allows it to do that. And what the PBGC did in that opinion letter was simply say, yes, you have the right to do this, and pointed out that there was nothing in the method that they used that was inconsistent. Now, there is one interesting thing about this opinion letter, which I frankly only realized when I was looking it over again yesterday. The rule that the Board of Trustees in that fund had adopted, and I stress, no similar rule has ever been adopted by the Local 863 Board, was that when you have an employer with multiple collective bargaining agreements, it would be acceptable 
to calculate the withdrawal liability annual payments separately for each contract and then add them. That was approved because the board had the authority under 4214 to do that. But there was one interesting thing in that opinion that, as I said, I just noticed yesterday. It did say that when you are using this method and looking at the contract by contract basis, you must use the highest rate under each contract. That's on page two of the opinion. And I wish I could give you the exact site because I have it printed out from one of my legal reference services. But it does specifically say that the increase, when you do it, you must look at each individual contract, the highest rate. Lastly, again, there is nothing here that anywhere in the statute, in any regulation, in any case law, that would undermine the principle that highest contribution rate means exactly what it says. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Hoffman. Thank you. May it please the Court. Matthew Hank, my colleague, is sitting at counsel table. May I reserve two minutes for rebuttal given the fact that we have cross appeals? We're getting to a tennis match when that happens. Why don't we just, again, be very generous with you and we'll let you pretty much tell us what you want to tell us and what you think is important for us to hear without getting into rebuttal because technically he could then ask to respond to your rebuttal. We're getting to rebuttal, so. Very good, Your Honor. The purpose of the Multi-Employer Plan Act withdrawal liability provisions was to eliminate the incentive for employers to withdraw. And they achieved this goal by requiring an employer to pay withdrawal liability in the form of annual payments in line with their previous contributions so as to make the liability an annual business cost. We are here today because the fund calculated the payments in a manner out of line with previous contributions and would force the payments to be almost 50 percent higher per year than Woodbridge's previous maximum annual contribution. But that's if you get hit with the surcharge. Right. Including the surcharge and taking into account the multiple rates. Right. Let's assume $3.69 is correct and then adjust it up to $4.06. Right. What are the raw numbers we're talking about if you don't get hit with the surcharge? That would reduce the rate by about 9 percent. Can you give us the dollar value? I can. I didn't really notice that in either brief. I mean, as I understand it, your argument is that you would be in the soup for about $189 million, but then you'd have to pay $171 million, I think. Well, keep in mind that the unfunded vested benefit allocation is not actually the withdrawal liability. That's just one part of the calculation. The withdrawal liability is defined in 29 U.S.C. 1381 as the unfunded vested benefits adjusted by a whole bunch of reductions, one of which is the 20-year cap. Essentially what MEPA does is they create a payment schedule and an employer pays that payment for up to 20 years, less than 20 years if the employer would pay off the unfunded vested benefits sooner. Otherwise, it stops at 20 years. So if you want to think about what withdrawal liability is, it's the payment schedule. It's not the unfunded vested benefits. But going back to your question, $8.5 million is what the fund assessed. If you take off the surcharges, you get to about $7.8 million, which is still considerably above the $5.7 million that is the most Woodbridge ever contributed in any year. If you look at the rate-by-rate approach, you get down to about $7 million. If you take both off, we think you get down to a little over $6 million. All right, but you can see, wouldn't you, that $5.7 million can't be the right number. That's not even equitable because the deal that was struck by Congress is you get a 20-year cap. Yes. Well, no, we're talking about per year. No, but you only pay for 20 years. Keep in mind that – What really matters is, I mean, I don't know, call me too soft-hearted, but I'm having trouble with your argument from equity because when I look at this and I see $189 million owed, $171 million paid, 
I think, well, you're still a little short. Now, I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong by being short. All you're doing is theoretically following the program that Congress has established. But I guess I'm saying I'm not crying crocodile tears for the company if you're still coming up a little short. What am I missing there? There are a lot of ways to think about that $187 million. A lot of that existed when Woodbridge joined this plan 13 years before Woodbridge withdrew. They joined a plan that was already significantly underfunded. Woodbridge paid every penny in contributions that was asked of Woodbridge, which went partially to pay for all those contributions have to cover what's called the normal cost, which means the employees of Woodbridge got their benefits paid for out of Woodbridge's contributions, plus something to cover the unfunded liabilities. Those unfunded liabilities grew while Woodbridge was in the plan, and when Woodbridge withdrew, the plan could stop accruing benefits for Woodbridge's employees, so all of the $6 to $8.5 million a year goes only to pay off unfunded vested benefits. So if you want to look at it that way, the fund's better off having a withdrawn employer paying withdrawal liability than it is having an active employer pulling money out in the form of additional accrued benefits. So the equities sort of go both ways here. That's what I'm, okay. The real question is what did Congress intend? The real question is what does the law require? Yeah, and the law was a balancing between the goal of trying to get as much money into the plans as possible and the goal of allowing employers to continue. They wanted, they didn't want to drive employers out of the system. So one of the purposes of all these various relief provisions is to make the withdrawal liability a business cost something in line with the contributions the employer had previously negotiated. I do want to address a few of the things that Mr. Hart said because I think they're simply wrong. First is if you look at Title 29 of USC, there's a table of contents, and there are about 30 titles of the various sections of Title 29. Only one of them is called Labor Management Relations, the very term used in 4212. And what's in that section? The National Labor Relations Act and a couple of other statutes that affect and the Labor Management Relations Act and the Welfare Plan Reporting Act. So you're saying it's not exclusive to the LMRA? It's not exclusive to the LMRA, but it is the... So he's right when he says they could have used the word act, but they used the word law, which broadens it a little bit. You're saying it's not broadened to cover everything that deals with labor management exactly. in the world. Well, exactly. How do we know that? What, what gives us the well, interpretive clue to, to prove your point? There are a couple of things that get us that, not only the Supreme Court opinion in advanced lightweight concrete, but you're talking about laws that affect the bargaining relationship between union and employers. In addition to the National Labor Relations Act, you've got the Railway Labor Act that governs airlines and railroads, mm -hmm. and you may have State Labor Relations Act that govern employers who are exempt from federal law such as farm workers, public employees, and that sort of thing. So you may have a number of... The nature of the NRLA as applied to particular industries or locations. Yes. Right. You also have to remember the purpose of that language in 4212 is primarily to judge the timing of a withdrawal. An employer withdraws when the employer no longer has an obligation to contribute under either the National Labor Relations Act or another labor management relations law, or the collective bargaining agreement expires. Because, as an advanced lightweight concrete, we know the employer continues after contract expiration, 4212 allows the timing of the withdrawal to be whenever that obligation under the law ends, even if the contract had previously expired. So these are the laws that govern the duration. PPA did not change that. There's nothing in PPA that affects the collective bargaining agreement or that requires the employer to change a collective bargaining agreement. The parties to the bargaining agreement can negotiate a contract that has zero contributions to withdraw. That was the Honerkamp case where the court, the fund was arguing in that case, an employer in a critical status plan can't withdraw from a plan because you've got these required rehabilitation plan increases. And the court said, no, no, no. All the rehabilitation plan does is it sets up a number of schedules that cabin what an acceptable collective bargaining agreement is if the employer is going to continue to contribute. If the employer and union negotiate something different, the trustees have two options. They can change the rehabilitation plan to reflect what the parties bargained, or they can kick out the employer. But they cannot rewrite the contract. 
There is nothing in the PPA that allows them to rewrite the contract. In addition, the Internal Revenue Code includes all of the PPA provisions. There are parallel provisions. They're all in the Internal Revenue Code. And Mr. Hart concedes the Internal Revenue Code is not a labor law. It's certainly not a labor management relations law. It's also important to point out that in order to be included in the payment formula, it has to be a contribution rate. And only if it's part of the contribution rate do you then turn to, is it part of the obligation to contribute? And it is the rate that's key, not the contribution. That's right. right. So it's got to be both. If the fund can't establish that the surcharges are contributions, it doesn't matter whether the PPA is an applicable labor management relations law. And they can't establish that they're contributions because the statute defines, says surcharges are to be treated as contributions for collection purposes and as contributions in determining uh, what is to, be con is to be a delinquent contribution. What they didn't, they emphasized contributions in their brief. They should have italicized the word as because it's the word as that's important and they would have to read as out of the statute in order for the surcharges to be contributions. I, w I do want to address... But before you move on yes. that, what, what about Mr. Hart made an interesting point um, I hadn't thought about, which is this new amendment. Your argument, as I understand it, is just because the new amendment has explicitly stated your position doesn't mean that your position didn't obtain all along. That's right. And, and, and you know, if, and I, if, you look if at I tell my teenagers next weekend not to drink beer at the party, that doesn't mean that I wanted them to drink beer at the party before I told them that. Yeah. But, but he raises an interesting point about the effective date. What about that? Well, why, why would they have said it's effective beginning? Well, it, there's a good reason why Congress would not have gone retroactive. A number of employers may have been assessed payments based on surcharges and not contested it, right? They made the payments. They let the 90 days for requesting review go by. Under then applicable law, that's final. There's no appeal. If Congress had made this section retroactive, would those employers have been able to come back and say, wait a minute, we're entitled to a refund because we made contributions based on what we thought was the law, and now you've said the law has changed, give us money back. So they would have opened up a whole hornet's nest by making it retroactive. Also, everything in that law that was pa passed in December was prospective, even sections that simply restated prior law. The entire provision relating to multi-employer plans was prospective only. And finally, they may just have decided, well, we'll let whatever cases are out there work their way through the system, we don't want to interfere with pending legislation. So those are, I think, three very good reasons why it was perspective only. And Sutherland, in the uh, treatise on statutory interpretation, says that if there is uncertainty as to what the law means, then a change in the law is deemed to be clarifying and not a change in substantive law. Only if it is accepted understanding of the law that everyone's unhappy with is a subsequent change deemed to be a change in substantive law. There's nothing in the legislative record that helps us in this case. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. There's that. nothing in the legislative record that helps us on this point. There is nothing in the legislative history at all that helps us. And in terms well, of why they even, the... They even, they, there was even a complaint that there was nothing. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble I, hearing There you. was even a complaint by one of the representatives that there was nothing in the record to help as well. Yeah. The, um, in, the, in the WERA amendment that Mr. Hart relies so heavily on, it's our view that when it said withdrawal liability and that got amended to be unfunded vested benefits, that was to correct an erroneous statement in the prior, it, it was a technical correction because in fact, withdrawal liability is defined in uh, eight, uh, 1381 as unfunded vested benefits adjusted by all these other things. And only for purposes of unfunded vested benefits did the surcharges have to be excluded because that's the only way, that, that referred to amounts rather than contributions. Because 
the contribution rate section 4219 says contributions and surcharges aren't contributions, they didn't need to amend that section. And also by excluding the attributable rule part of the UVB allocation from that exception, the effect was so that employers who paid surcharges in their attributable rule plan get the credit for the surcharge toward their unfunded vested benefits. So in effect, the amendment made sure that employers who paid surcharges weren't hurt by paying surcharges. That's the overarching reading of that little section of ERISA that affects the calculation of unfunded vested benefits. I briefly want to get to the multiple rate section. The fact is that Woodbridge, every month, counted up the contribution base units for eight different rate groups. And for each of those rate groups, in February of 2011, they multiplied those contribution base units by the highest rate for each of those rate groups. And that's the check they wrote to the plan. Statute doesn't say rate groups, though. It says the highest contribution rate. Yes. You seem to pivot pretty quickly in your brief to legislative history, which, frankly speaking for myself, was, as legislative history often is, underwhelming. It was, I didn't see anything despised. I don't know if you're going there. Yeah. Because the application of statute doesn't help. Right. There is nothing. Your other argument is a better argument. Yeah. Isn't it? It is stronger. That is certainly true. The legislative history, there are no examples in legislative history of multiple rates at the same time. There are only examples in legislative history of rates changing from one year to the next. And it's also very, and the only reference to the payment schedule is the reference to it being in line with the employer's previous level of contributions. Whatever that means. Well, I think we know what in line means. Well, I don't know. If I was a fund, I would think in line means a one-for-one deduction, a one-for-one contribution. What do we do with the text and what it says, the highest contribution rate? What do we do with that? We believe that if you, just as in 90-2, and by the way, 4214 doesn't clearly allow the rule that was adopted by the plan in Opinion Letter 90-2. 4214 simply says that any rule adopted by the plan under the statute has to be applied uniformly. So the plan asked the PBGC if highest rate was clear or if they could use this different approach to the term of highest rate, which means we'll look to the different contracts. In that case, each contract had only one rate. The PBGC said, yes, you're right. The statutory intent was to have the payment replicate or be similar to what the employer had previously been paying. The employer previously paid at three different rates for three different agreements, so you can look at the statute that way. In this case, the employer paid at eight different rate groups for different groups of employees. And that rate changed over time. You did that switch again. You put rate units in there. As opposed to highest contribution rate, you put the highest rate unit in there. No, I'm saying the highest rate within each rate group, just like in 90-2, it was the highest rate within each collective bargaining agreement. In 90-2. Why wouldn't you do the highest rate with all that universe of rates and differences? Why wouldn't you just look at that universe and take the rate which was the highest and that becomes the rate under withdrawal liability? That's the exact question that the trust asked the PBGC in 90-2. And the PBGC said, no, you don't have to look at the one of the three that were paid simultaneously. You can look at all three. In our case, we have eight. Eight highest rates. The rates changed over time. They went up from one year to the next in each job classification and rate group. So the highest was the one in effect in February 2011 for each of those eight groups. Are you saying we owe deference to the PBGC in this regard? To the extent it is persuasive, yes. If it's not persuasive, then you don't. Is it Skidmore deference? I mean, it's not Chevron deference. It's Skidmore deference. I agree with you there. Ms. Huffman, I can kind of sympathize with you here. I mean, you understand at least my concern in terms of what the text says, and you've kind of got to get around that. The Skidmore deference is one way to 
I guess, undermine what the text of the statute is, but I, I sense you wish that you'd been left with a little stronger hand to play. I'm not asking you to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Hart, you have reserved some time. We gave you a lot of time up front, and be mindful of what my first trial judge told me when I asked him how I did with my closing argument. He told me the mind can only absorb what the seat can endure, and the key went way too long in your closing argument. So. <laughs> Uh, I, never I once, got that uh, advice. I was once appeared up. before a district judge who, in order to keep uh, oral arguments down, said, I made up my mind. Do you want to try to change it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to try to be very brief. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hoffman went through a sort of a scattershot number of arguments, and I will try to just address some of the major ones that she made. The first one is that, again, what she is maintaining and what her client is maintaining is that somehow the legislative history can override the clear words that the statute used, it pointed out its established law of, of interpretation of statutes, that you don't do that when you have a statute that's clear on its face as this one is. Um, that's your argument on the rate, the contribution. That's correct. Right, now, why doesn't to that the, come around to bite you on the surcharge? Well, because, because the law... Because, uh, 1085E7B says that the surcharge is collected on the same schedule and enforced like a contribution, correct? Well, that's exactly the point I'm making, yes. Well, but but if, if a surcharge is just part and parcel of a constitu uh, contribution, then that w the language I just read w would be a nullity. Yeah, the as is a problem for you. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I follow your argument. If, 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 if a surcharge is part and parcel of a contribution, yes. then the statutory scheme wouldn't refer to it and say that we collect the surcharge on the same schedule as we collect a contribution. Well, the, the they first one and the same. They're, the first premise to the, the argument that you're making is that the second part of the statute with respect to highest contribution rate is clear and totally unequivocal. I can't tell you that it actually is. I think that it is the most reasonable interpretation of what is meant by the obligation to contribute, that it includes highest contribution rate. And one of the, argu the arguments that I've made as to why that's a reasonable interpretation of what is meant by highest contribution rate, and remember, the, the uh, second part of the formula is you multiply is you multiply the average number of uh, uh, of uh, uh, contract bargaining units uh, times the highest contribution rate. Well, where you have multiple contribution rates here, you pick the highest. And in this case, we've got a couple of th reasons why the imposition of the surcharge. Remember the surcharge is more than just a percentage. It means that, say, if your contribution rate is $1 and you're then subject to surcharge, then now your contribution rate is, becomes $1.10. There are two reasons why that those are both obligations to contribute and therefore are part of the highest contribution rate. The first is that it is required by this related agreement, being the trust agreement of the 863 pension fund, and there's lots of law which we've cited that says that an employer that contributes is uh, obligated by the terms of the trust agreement of those plans, even though its collective bargaining agreements don't make express reference to it. But the second reason is that this is an obligation that's imposed by an applicable labor management relations law. Now, we've pointed out that the Congress was not limiting this to the NLRA. Everything else that, in fact, uh, uh, is, is in the uh, subtitle of Title 29 that uh, uh, Ms. Hoffman was referring to doesn't really relate to uh, the – well, it may relate to the relationship between – uh, management and employees, it doesn't impose any specific obligations on anyone to contribute. Here we've got a statute that does impose an obligation on a uh, employer to make additional contributions. When you take a, and also, when you take a look at how the PPA has changed, it is clear that Congress has now twice changed its view as to how it's going to look at this. As I pointed out, the original PPA 
said that you didn't take into account surcharge for any purpose except for the purpose of allocating unfunded vested benefits. Then when WERA 2008 passed, Congress basically reversed that, saying then that you don't take into account surcharges for purposes of determining or allocating unfunded vested benefits, but then said nothing about whether it was to be taken into account in considering whether it was a highest contribution rate. Then just last month, Congress changed its mind again and now stated, well, now we don't want it to be included for any purpose. In fact, prior to the Multi-Employer Pension Reform Act, there was no statement that increases that were required by employers that adopted a schedule or had a schedule imposed on them by a rehabilitation plan or funding improvement plan could be excluded from this. And now the statute says that you don't take into account in considering what the highest contribution rate is, a surcharge or any other contribution increase provided under the requirements of the Pension Protection Act. I think that it's not fair to say that the statute in this respect is absolutely clear and unwavering. I think that what is fair to say is that the reasonable interpretation of the statute, especially when you look at how contributions are treated elsewhere, 305E7 says that it is a contribution accepted that can be enforced like anything else. And then Section 304B also says that payments under withdrawal liability are also regarded as contributions. Now, in 4211, although those are regarded as contributions, they are excluded specifically. But anyway, the point I'm making here is that when you look at the statute as a whole, you look at it in the context of the entire ERISA scheme, and you look at it in relationship to how Congress has changed the law since 2008, since 2006. I think it's clear that it's a reasonable interpretation that an increase in contributions required by the PPA is considered. And one last point. There is still a limitation. I'm so sorry, Your Honor. If someone says one last point, I get concerned. You're right. I'm going to take my books and go home, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Counsel, for helping us. Very, very knowledgeable attorneys. I don't think I've had the pleasure of having either of you argue before me before, but hopefully you'll be back. But thank you very much. We'll take the matter under advisement. Thank you, Your Honor.